the past two and a half years we've been going through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, sometimes, as you're going through Luke, you hit a passage which is so important that uh, you can't just do a half an hour sermon on it. You need to do a few more lessons to understand it better. And last week, as we were going through Luke, Luke chapter 23, we read about the death of Jesus Christ. And so how can you speak about the death of Jesus Christ in half an hour? So what we're going to do today is address the question why Jesus died on the cross. We're not going to be in Luke. We're going to be in all kinds of passages. Uh, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? What was the point of his death? Uh, and and in, in discussing Jesus' death, we're basically dealing with the very heart of the gospel. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says that the gospel is the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. So, what we're going to do today is we're basically going to talk about what the gospel is. We need to understand the gospel. What does gospel mean, first of all? It comes from the Greek word evangelio. Ev and agelia, which means good news. When we talk about the gospel, we're talking about the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, I have often said, we cannot understand the good news before we understand the bad news. We won't be able to appreciate the good news unless we fully understand the bad news. In, in uh, the book of Romans, the book of Romans is probably... Uh, gives the most detailed explanation of the gospel. In chapter 1, Paul starts, Paul starts and he says, uh, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. Yet, it's not until chapter 3 that he actually preaches the good news. He spends two and a half chapters explaining bad news so that the good news will make sense. Let me, tell you, let me tell you why this is important. Let's, get, let's give an example. Let's assume that George... <laughs> let's assume that George is in his car and he stopped at a red light. And he's like, ah, no one's coming. No, no one can see me. I'll just go. And he goes through the red light. And there's a camera there that takes a picture of his license plate. And so the police now knows that he has broken the law. So one day I'm going over to George's house and as I'm ready to go into his house I see the police coming and I say, what's the problem? And they say, well, this guy in here, he broke the law and I'm here with a ticket of 500 euros. And I say, man, I don't know if George has the money to pay for that. So, you know what, tell you what, I'll pay for the ticket. And so I give the money to the police officer and I pay the ticket. All right? So I go into George's house and I say, George, I have great news. Let me tell you the good news. You don't have to pay the fine anymore. George would be like, what are you talking about? What fine? There's no fine. I didn't have a fine. Yes, you had a fine of 500 euros and you don't have to pay it because I paid it. He'd be like, what are you talking about? There is no fine of 500. You're just making stuff up now. Unless I explain to him the bad news... He doesn't understand the good news. And the bad news is, look, you went through the red light, you got a ticket, you had to pay 500 bucks, but I paid it for you, so you don't have to pay it. Oh, now I get, now I understand what the bad news was, and now, therefore, I get the good news, and I appreciate the good news. So, before we explain the good news, the gospel, we need to understand what the bad news behind it is, so we can appreciate the good news. So, what's the bad news? You've, I've been talking about bad news, bad news. What is the bad news? You ready for this? Bad news is that God is good and holy and just. And you're like, not quite following you there, Nico. That doesn't sound too bad for me. No, this is terrible news for us because if God is just and we are sinners, what should a just God do with us? That's our problem. 
That's our problem. God said to Adam, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you shall die. That's the punishment. Romans chapter 6 says, the wages of sin is death. When God spoke to Moses, he gave him the law, and he said, do this and live. In other words, if you don't do it, you'll die. Man is both body and spirit. We're not just a body. Which means that death as a punishment is not just physical death. It is both spiritual death. So what we deserve is, when we sin, is physical and spiritual death. That is the punishment. Now, you may say... Okay, I, I get that since we're sinners, God should punish us. But can't God just forgive us? Right? Can't He just forgive us? I mean, isn't God merciful and loving and kind? Can't God just forgive us? Well, let's think, let's think about this for a moment. Let's think about this. Let me give you an example. Let's assume you go home and you find... Going to get graphic now. You find someone that you love, some family member, murdered. And the murderer is right there. You know that they're guilty. And you grab them, and you take them to court, and the murderer is standing before the judge. What if the judge said, you know what, I'm a really loving, kind, and merciful judge, so I forgive you, you can go. What would you think? Would you like that? Would you like that? If the judge said, I'm really kind and merciful, so this person who killed your family, they can go. You would stand up and scream. You would be pulling your hair out. Because that's injustice. The person is guilty, therefore, he needs to be punished. If the judge is any good, he must punish him. Must. It would be a scandal for him not to. So let's go back to the previous question. Can't God just forgive our sins? Can't He just forgive us? Answer, no, of course not. That would be unjust of Him. If God is just, He must punish us. Must. Could you please turn in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 17. Look at verse 15. It says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Listen to the sentence. He who justifies the wicked is an abomination to God. Okay? What is, you have justification and condemnation. Those are the two opposites. If you take a person to a judge, he will either justify him, say that he is just and righteous and let him go, or he will condemn him. Correct? Now, here it says that if a guilty person, a wicked person, comes to the judge, and that judge justifies him, declares him to be just, that is an abomination to God, because that's injustice. That's a lie. That's a scandal. You cannot say that someone is just when he is guilty. So, go back to us. Hear me out, this is important. Ready to be shocked? If God is just and righteous, He cannot forgive you. Think about it. This is our problem. This is the bad news. What are we going to do about this? You may be saying... Nico, I'm hoping, I'm hoping for something better than this. I hope we don't just end like this, because this is not good. Now, at this point, people will try and get out of this, try and escape this concept of uh, punishment for our sins. And they may say something like, Okay, I know that I've sinned. I know that I've sinned against God. But what if 
uh, I try and be real good from now on. I'll try and be better. Do I still need to be punished? Can't I just be better from now on? Okay? Let's think about it. Let's think about it. Let's take the guy again who murdered our family. What if this murderer stands before the judge and says, Yes, I know I murdered their family, but I'm going to try and be real good from now on. Would you appreciate the judge saying, oh, Okay, then you can go free. Would you like that? No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. That's not justice. That's not justice. What most people do when you talk about sin and punishment, they will try and excuse the sin. They'll say, look, yes, I understand that I'm a sinner. Yes, I get that. But my sins are not that bad. They're not that bad. Nico, you're talking about murdering people. I didn't murder anyone. Yes, I've done sins, but they're not that bad so as to require punishment from God. Could you please turn to James chapter 2? The book of James in chapter 2. And verse 10. It says, For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. What's his point? He says, you have one law. There's only one law. There are many different commandments within that law. And he says, if you break one commandment, you've broken the law. You've broken the law. You don't have to break all the commandments in order to be punished. He said, and the example that he brings is, you know, uh, if you're a murderer, you can't say, well, I haven't committed adultery. Who cares? You don't have to break all of God's commandments in order to be punished. If, if you went and robbed a bank, and they take you to put you in jail, you can't say, oh, but I didn't kill anyone. Yeah. Is, is murder the only crime worth punishing? There, there's all these crimes. It, the law is like a chain. Picture a chain that is made up of individual commandments. And you're holding on to the end. You break one... Down you go. You don't have to break every little crico. Now, again, someone will say, but Nico, again, you're, you're talking about murder and, uh, and uh, robbing banks. I don't do stuff like that. I'm not that bad. My sins are not that bad. Listen to me. Adam and Eve ate a fruit. They ate a fruit. Was it that bad? Yes, it was one of the worst sins ever committed in the world. Why? Because all sins, no matter how big you regard them to be, all sins have the same root, and that is disobedience to God. God says, live this way, and you say, no, I'm not going to live that way, I'm going to live any way I want. You may say, oh, I haven't done anything that bad. Have you lied? You say, ah, sin, uh, lying isn't that bad. Really? Jesus said, I am the truth. And he said that Satan is the father of lies. So when we're lying, we're aligning ourselves with Satan rather than with Jesus. You think lying isn't bad? Have you ever coveted? Have you ever committed uh, idolatry by bow bowing down to an image? Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever blasphemed? Oh no, I've never blasphemed. I've never taken the Lord's name in vain. These things are serious crimes. And we tend to think, well, I haven't murdered anyone, so it's all good. Even though Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, that's equal to murder. You see, in Galatians chapter 3, Paul quotes Deuteronomy, and he says, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to perform them. He says, if you do, the law says that if you do not continue in the law, obeying the law, you are cursed. And the wrath of God will come upon you. So this is seriously bad news. All of us have broken God's law. And it's not just once or twice. It's often. Many times. 
throughout all our lives. And so, the bad news is that if God is just, and He is a good and righteous judge, He must punish us. That's the bad news. You had enough of bad news? Tell you what. Let me tell you the good news. Let me tell you the, the good news. Alright? Let me tell you the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news is this, that even though God is just, He is also loving. And in His love, He allows for a substitute to be punished in your place. You may say, well that's not fair. That's not fair that someone dies and someone is punished for me. Uh, that would be true if God forced someone in your place and killed them. But the Lord Jesus Christ, willingly, out of love for us, gave Himself to be our substitute. To pay for our sins. The punishment that we deserve, He says, I will take it for them. There's a very important word in the Bible. Very important word. That we, we, we really, most of the time, we don't know what it means. I will, I will explain it. The word is propitiation. You find the word propitiation in the Bible a number of times, and you're like, wow, that's, I don't know what that means, so you just kind of read it and move on. But it's a very important word. We don't use it anymore. Back 2,000 years ago, it was used all the time. It was a very common word, but today, no one knows what it means. Um, even in the Greek, it's ilasmos, or ilastirio. You're like, I don't know what that is. We don't use that anymore. Well, what does it mean? Propitiation is a sacrifice which takes away the wrath of God leading you to have favor with God. Let me give you an example. Let's assume that this is you and here's God ready to pour down His wrath upon you. A propitiation is a sacrifice that goes in between you and God, and as the wrath is supposed to come down, it comes onto the propitiation, and it's not like an umbrella that it just kind of falls off the side. The propitiation absorbs the wrath, takes the wrath, satisfies the deity, the God, and therefore you get to go free. There's no more wrath to be poured down on you. That's what propitiation means. And the scripture speaks of Christ as being our propitiation. 1 John chapter 4 says this, In this is love. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. That means that God loved us and sent Jesus to be the sacrifice that will take His wrath for our sins. So there is no more wrath left to come upon you. This is good news. Now, some people, some people argue and they say, that sounds so primitive. So, so uh, these are things that ancient pagan civilizations believed in. And you believe in these kind of things? It's so primitive that, that we need a sacrifice to, to appease the wrath of the deity. Ooh, so I can't believe you modern Christians believe such things. But here's the difference. And, and, and it's true that all ancient religions had propitiations where they would try and appease the wrath of their deity. That's true. That's why we know what the word means. It's a, it was a very common practice. But here's the difference. Here's me, hear me out. Here's the difference between all those ancient pagan religions and Christianity. In the pagan religions, their deity required of you to present some kind of sacrifice and appease Him. In Christianity, and this is the glory of the Gospel, in Christianity, God Himself becomes a man and offers Himself as a propitiation on your behalf. God the Son, Jesus Christ, becomes a man so that He can be offered as a propitiation to the Father. God does not require of you. He Himself provides the sacrifice. That is the glory of the Gospel. 
Now, I know I mention this verse all the time, but it's highly important. So please go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's break this down. For he, who's he? God the Father. For God the Father made him, who's the him? Jesus Christ. God the Father made Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Now, let me stop there for a moment, because it mentions Jesus knowing no sin. We're so used to reading that, we're so used to reading that Jesus knew no sin, that we just kind of read, just fly by that. This is unbelievable. I want you to think about this for a moment. We don't appreciate the fact that Jesus never sinned, because we, tend, we don't think of sin as being that bad. We think of ourselves and we're like, yeah, I sinned. Sometimes Jesus never sinned. Uh, okay, no big deal. <laughs> Listen to me. We have been sinning all our life. All our life. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. Question. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time you loved God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength and all of your mind? When was the last time you did that? Answer. Never. None of us have ever loved God the way that He deserves to be loved. There, are, there is always sin in us. There is always impure motives. There is always impure thoughts. To what, even when we do good, it is always mixed with some kind of self-approval, self-justification or whatever, self-satisfaction. And so, think about this. We have never fully love God the way we should. We have never been completely without sin. What we cannot do for one second in our life, Jesus did all of His life. Jesus never sinned in motive, thought, or deed. Never. This is astounding. And we need to keep that in mind. And this perfect, holy, 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 sinless man, it says, was made sin for us. Our sin and our filth is placed upon him. This is why when we saw him in Gethsemane, he says, he, he speaks of the cup that he has to drink. This is the cup of the wrath of God that should be poured down on us, but rather he is going to drink it all. This is why last week we saw Jesus hanging on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he is being treated as a sinner in our place. And more than that, not only does it say that he became sin for us, but it said that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. This is the glorious substitution. Not only is our sin placed upon Him and He is punished for it, but all His righteousness and goodness is placed upon us. Did you ever wonder why Jesus had to live 33 years on earth? Why didn't Jesus just kind of fly in on Good Friday, come down, die, and go back to heaven? He lived a full life as a baby, as a child, as a grown-up. And fulfilled all righteousness, obeyed God's law in everything, so that that perfect account can be given to you. And all your terrible sinful account can be given to Him. He gets punished for your sin, and you get to go free because of His perfect life. And you may ask, how can I get this great gift of salvation? Answer, faith. Repentance and faith. We don't have to go there. You know the text. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says that it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. What kind of work are you going to do and say, I am now righteous before God? You can't. 
So it is by faith alone in Christ. When I say we need to have faith in Christ, we're not simply saying believe some facts about Him. When we're saying have faith in Him, we're saying trust in Him as your Savior. Let me give you an example to try and understand this. Let's assume that you're in a plane and you jump out of the plane, okay? And you've got a parachute on your back. You are trusting in that parachute for your salvation. Alright? If that parachute does not open, you will die. No question. You're not going to sprout wings all of a sudden. Okay? You're falling. There is nothing but air between you and the ground. The only way that you will be saved if it is if that parachute opens. So you trust that pa that parachute will open. You've put your life in the hands of that parachute. That is what we're talking about when we're saying trust in Christ. It's saying, by myself, I'm going to die. I got no hope on my own. My hope is that Christ will save me. And I trust in Him and in what He did for me. That is the gospel. Let me show you one final passage before we're done. Please go to Philippians chapter 3. In chapter 3 of Philippians... Paul is uh, dealing with people who seem to think that they can somehow gain some kind of righteousness before God by being good and following the law and stuff like that, especially being Jewish. And here, here's what Paul has to say. Philippians chapter 3, let's start in verse uh, 3. He says, For we, speaking of Christians, we are the circumcision not the Jews, who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. He's saying we don't have confidence in the flesh, in ourselves, in our bodies, that we can somehow be righteous before God. Verse 4. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. He is challenging. He is saying if anyone else thinks that you're good enough for heaven, for God, and you're righteous enough, I'm better than you. <laughs> and he gives the examples. Look at this. Speaking of himself, verse 5. He says, circumcised the eighth day. Alright? I started off good. I'm a Jew and I got circumcised. Of the stock of Israel. Hey, I'm a Jew. I'm an Israelite. I'm not a pagan Gentile. I'm a Jew. Alright? Of the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, Benjamin, that's one of the good tribes. When there was the split, when ten tribes all went and ran away from David, there was one that stuck with Judah. That was Benjamin. That's a good tribe to be a part of right there. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, a Pharisee. Pharisee. Wow, the Pharisees were the most meticulous when it came to the law. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. That's how zealous I was. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I was following the law perfectly. No one could point at me and say, Saul, you broke the law. No, I was blameless. I was fantastic. Verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. He is saying, all these things that I gained, that I thought were going to make me righteous before God, I count them as rubbish, as dung, that's a probably a better translation, as dung, animal poop. That's what I consider all the righteous deeds that I used to do. Like Isaiah said, all our righteousness before him are as filthy rags. Listen to this, verse 9. He is, and he says, Because I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. What kind of righteousness do I have? Like Isaiah said, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in his sight. Everything that I've ever done is sinful. What am I supposed to go and present to God? It's like taking dung and saying, here, will this do? But he says, forget my own righteousness from the law. 
I want to stand before God in the righteousness that is from God by faith. That is how we can stand. And how do we get this? Because of what Christ did for us. Through Christ's life and through Christ's death and the exchange. And God treats me as though I had lived Christ's life. And I am clothed in His righteousness. Let me close with this. Let me close with this. Hear me out. If you go to a Jewish person and you say to him, are you going to go to heaven? He'll say, I hope so. You say, well, what, what, is, what is your hope? What is your hope based upon? He'll say, well, you know, I, I, love, I, love, uh, I love God. I love uh, the law of God. And I am trying to keep the law of God as well as I can. And hopefully in the end I will have, I'll be good enough to make it to heaven. That's the position. If you go to a Muslim and you say to him, are you going to heaven? He'll say, well, I hope so. Okay, what is your hope? What is it based upon? He'll say, well, you know, I, I love Allah and I love the Quran. And, um, you know, I say the Shahada every day. You know, there's one God, Allah and his messenger, uh, um, Muhammad. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've gone to Mecca, done the pilgrimage, and I pray five times a day towards Mecca, and, you know, hopefully that'll be good enough to get, it, to get through in the end. If you go to a Greek Orthodox person, and you say to him, are you going to go to heaven? He'll say, I don't know, I hope so. Okay, what is your hope based upon? Well, I, I was baptized when I was a baby. I go to church every Sunday. I, I go and I confess my sins to the priest. I, uh, I, I have communion and hopefully all, all these religious works will, will give me enough grace at the end of my life and hopefully I'll make it to heaven. If you ask a Christian, a true Christian, are you going to go to heaven? He'll say, yeah. Ooh, that's bold of you to say that you're going to go to heaven. What is your hope? What is that hope based upon? You'll say, well, I really haven't done as much as I should have. I, I, I really haven't loved God as He deserves. And I, I, I really haven't gone to church enough. And I haven't read my Bible enough. And I haven't prayed enough. And I really haven't done enough to satisfy God. And you're sitting there scratching your head saying, okay, well, why do you think you're even going to go to heaven then? Well, because Jesus paid the penalty for my sins. And Romans chapter 8 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God is not going to punish the same sin twice. If Jesus paid for your sins, what have you got to pay for? Nothing. Nothing. That's why Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Having been justified by faith, we now have peace with God. God is not your enemy. God is not angry with you because of what Christ did for you. And you can go free through faith in Him. That is the gospel. Bad news is that you should be punished. Good news is that Christ comes and takes the punishment for you. That is the gospel. Many people keep talking about so many things as though they are the gospel and they don't know what they're talking about. Some people say, oh the gospel is you know, just loving God and loving your neighbor. That's not the gospel. That's the law. The law says love God and love your neighbor. That is what the gospel produces, obedience to the law. The gospel is faith in Christ who forgives your sins. And so, if we are Christians, praise the Lord and go tell other people about this glorious gospel. Thank you for your attention. Let's pray.